Today's show is brought to you by Work Life with Adam Grant, a podcast from TED. Our work lives and world have changed dramatically in recent weeks. And if you're looking to explore the science of making work not suck in these trying times, you should check out Work Life with Adam Grant. This season, you'll learn how to procrastinate less with Margaret Atwood and how small wins can help you fight burnout. New episodes come out on Tuesdays. I know I'll be listening. Listen to Work Life with Adam Grant wherever you get your podcasts. From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel. And this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Most nights around 10 o'clock on the East Coast, Kabir Segal goes live on the internet with a musician. Like, for example, the pianist Amelia Soja. Do I look good like that? You look great. Hello, everyone. I'm going to make sure we're, we're rolling here. These are intimate concerts. They feel more like being in someone's living room, because usually that's where you are. Kabir produces music. When the quarantine started, he got really worried for his musician friends. They depend on gigs to get by. So he raised some money to put on these shows and to make sure musicians get paid for them. He calls these shows the Quarantine Concert Series. Now this episode, it's the second part of our series about the lost art of 2020. Last week, we talked about live events. This week, we'll take a look at some virtual events. Can a live stream concert feel as magic as one that you actually go to? What new things are being born right now that really couldn't exist before this? Later in the show, I'll talk to the Broadway actress Laura Benanti. She issued this invitation to high school musical stars, the ones who weren't going to get to perform. She said, hey, share your work with me. I'll listen. But first, you got to meet Kabir. He's a bit of a polymath. He's been a musician, an investment banker, a military officer, an author, and most recently a music producer. He's won multiple Grammy and Latin Grammy awards for his producing work. And we started our conversation looking back at what he was doing before the pandemic. Here's Kabir. Before the pandemic, I've been uh, I've been sort of sourcing projects, and a lot of musicians, especially in the the music I work in, jazz, classical, uh, world music, Latin music, um, I try to work with artists to come up with ideas. And a lot of our projects we explore social themes, uh, things that are happening in the news. And so I work with an artist to develop an idea of what project should they do in the first place? Not what notes should you, should you write, but what project, what ideas should we um, deal with and consider for the, the theme of the project? And then I work with an artist across the entire um, the entire aspect of the project, which is helping raise the money, helping get the distribution in place, actually helping write the music. So in my definition of producer, someone who just gets something done and gets the job done. And I've been able to sort of work effectively and I've built a team now. And so we're doing about... 20 albums a year, um, which is a lot. And, uh, and we're really excited with how some of these, some of these albums have turned out. And now, um, art, artists and record labels are reaching out to me and asking me if I can help their artists put the pro- put projects out. And, um, it's, it's a really great position to be in. And I love putting out music and working, working with artists. I, I'd love to sort of go back to the point at which the economy began shutting down. At what point did your business start to change? My business started to change when a lot of film festivals started uh, canceling and postponing. I think when uh, South by Southwest uh, put out an advisory that they were considering, you know, postponing or canceling the event, because I have a lot of musician friends, a lot of filmmaker friends that are presenting their works there, things that I've worked on as well. All of a sudden, um, people started to cancel studio dates with me and people started to cancel um, film sessions. And so my calendar started to open up because, um, you know, People were, were concerned about their personal health, and I totally get it. So then I, I actually landed in San Diego, and for a, a film festival, I was going to debut a film that I was working on, and I opened up my email, and there was like seven emails that say, you know, everything's been canceled. So I caught the next flight back to Atlanta to my parents' house, and I, that's where I've been. I've been hunkered down in a defensive crouch uh, ever since. Defensive crouch is the word. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How were you feeling then? I mean, when you when you arrived in San Diego and you got those seven emails. I felt bad because, you know, the night before I confirmed, is this event actually going to happen? Everyone said yes. And then the uh, California government said, you know, no crowds larger than I think, like 50 people or something. And um, I felt bad for everyone who's, you know, been working on our project for so long. This is a four-year-long project. We were going to debut the film. 
And, uh, you know, there's so many people involved with live events. Uh, it's not just the artists, it's the producers and the engineers, the promoters and the bookers. A lot of people make all their income from events. And my heart went out to all of these people. I feel right now I was feeling bad for everyone else. And I've been trying to be part of the solution ever since. Well, what was the film that you were going to debut and what was your role? Uh, the film is called Fandango at the Wall. And uh, I was the uh, executive producer and producer and screenwriter. And I appear in it. It's basically a music film that we recorded at the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And we had we put a jam session together where we had musicians on both sides. And so the film is really it looks at the idea of borders and immigration through this music called Sonora Rocho. And it's the most beautiful art form I've ever experienced because it's the most immersive art form I've ever experienced. When you go to a Fandango, when you play Son Hiroshi music, there's literally a hundred people holding the guitar, playing together, and in the middle are people tap dancing. And it's a very communal expression of like love and gratitude and joy. And there is no divide between the audience and the performers because anyone can just pick up a guitar and play. And I just fall in love with this idea that we're all performers and can all be part of this musical tradition called Fandango and Son Hiroshi. Kabir, it kind of breaks my heart to know that it didn't get its big debut. What does that mean for the film in terms of whether it will be distributed? Yeah, good good question. I mean, we've been, <laughs> we've been blessed. We've had some great um, uh, wins in terms of our executive producers, Carlos Santana, uh, Andy Young, uh, Quincy Jones. So they've, uh, you know, they've blessed our film with some great sort of visibility. And our film has attracted interest from sales agents at this point. So we've had some interest from distributors, but... At this point, the last couple of weeks, I think everyone's been shell-shocked. So, like, you know, getting folks to respond to emails and stuff has been a little slow. I'm hoping I can I can pull this off for the team. You know, I heard somebody refer to where we are this morning as a deep hibernation. And then there's this question looming over us. Are we going to just turn on the machine and keep going again at some point? Or is it going to be like this for a long time? And I don't think we know, Kabir. Yeah, and I think it's hard... It's very disruptive and you can't just sort of snap your fingers and everyone comes back to work uh, a lot. There's a big system, you know, people are going to miss mortgage payments and um, it's hard for people to recover. I think this is going to be with us, you know, from an economic standpoint, at least for the next six months, because companies will be revising their numbers downwards and there's going to be, we're probably entering into a recession. I don't know officially what the numbers are going to come out, but it's probably going to be the next six months of, of, of pain economically. And that, is really problematic for artists, both because we can't see their work and because they can't get resources for their work. Hundred percent. They're, um, you know, they often say that creative life is the most interesting life because you get to work with all you know, different people and express these amazing ideas. But the problem is, is you often don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from, and that that's the case for you know top actors and musicians. They're just living gig to gig, and when all the gigs have vanished, they don't make any money. So it's really difficult for them. So tell me how your concert series came about. So I have a bit of a history of trying to find performance opportunities for musicians. In uh, in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina happened, I was actually living in New Orleans right before that. And I was part of the recovery efforts in that I started an organization that helped book musicians uh, all across you know America. And then we would charge a commission and donate those commissions to New Orleans to help the musicians come back to the city. This time around, the situation is much larger. It's not concentrated to one city. It's, it's concentrated to <laughs> the entire world. So I happen to know, like, I don't know, a few hundred musicians, uh, many of whom I worked with. And I started getting emails that, you know, everyone's gigs were canceled. So I thought, what can we do to feature musicians and p- create performance opportunities for them? So I created what's called the Quarantine Concert Series. And we're live um, every night at 10 p.m. Eastern on LinkedIn, on all platforms. And... Uh, we feature musicians. A lot of these are, uh, you know, Grammy award winning musicians, um, uh, top musicians who you've heard with and every single musician uh, gets paid and you can watch for free and interact with these musicians. It's been really heartening to see just the consistency of doing it every night. People, a lot of my friends and, you know, in wider community are starting to see that, you know, 10 PM Eastern, they can always see like a world-class performer um, bring helping to bring us together in this difficult time. You know, Kabir, I stumbled upon your series. Um, I just happened to be online at some point when my social network told me you'd gone live. And it was one of your first, I think it was your first performance, and it was this Argentinian pianist. I'd never heard of him. 
And the music was beautiful. And it was so beautiful that I quickly uh, texted a friend of mine who is an Argentinian and a musician and said, you really got to hear this pianist. And she shot back, well, God, that's the most famous pianist in all of Argentina. And I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hadn't realized yeah. the, the caliber of musician you've been able to bring out for this. How is the financial piece of this working? How are you able to do this? Well, I've been blessed in my uh, life. I've, I was you know, previously an investment banker and I've been making investments, I think, hopefully wisely, although the, the last few weeks um, have, have <laughs> thrown that into doubt as well. Nobody feels wise after the past few weeks. Yeah, exactly. I've been trying to, I've been paying them, you know, myself and some friends have been contributing. And uh, I mean, it's not a ton of money, but it's something meaningful to each musician. Uh, when there's you know zero coming in, I think every bit every bit uh, matters. And a lot of these artists, like the artist you mentioned, the Argentinian Emilio Soja, he is like a multi Grammy nominated artist, and he's a masterful composer. I mean, the way he sort of the emotional poignancy of his compositions is so profound. And we we've produced I think two albums together. So I literally like called him and I I said, man, we got to figure this out. I'm gonna put you on um, this broadcast in like 30 minutes. So we had very little planning. And we just hit live on our phones, and next thing you know, we were broadcasting, and uh, and now it's turned into to I don't know if it's a movement, but a lot more traction and interest. So yes, it is. There are world class musicians. Um, I'm paying for it myself, and uh, you know, just trying to keep this thing rolling. There's something about it that feels a little bit like maybe it's a hundred years ago, and it's just you, Kabir, the musician, and me sitting in a living room somewhere, kind of talking it out and listening. Um, and it, it's kind of amazing that one can create something like that on the internet. I got to tell you, the most intimate performances I've been to have been in people's living rooms and homes. When I lived in New Orleans, it was a regular thing where you'd go over to someone's home and there'd be a musician playing. And um, I grew up in a household here in Atlanta where my parents would throw a dinner party and there's always musicians. And so it always struck me that, you know, seeing Winston Marcellus live at Lincoln Center was amazing. Uh, but seeing, in some, seeing him in someone's home or like Emilia Soja or Arturo O'Farrell, like in their living rooms, um, it's incredibly intimate and you get to see sort of their creative space uh, because a lot of musicians, uh, they work from home, they create from home. That's their studio, that's their work environment. And so you sort of get a peek into their creative process and their reality. Um, you know, their, their reality is not playing Carnegie Hall every night. Their reality is living in, you know, a small place in and wherever they are, and in Washington Heights, and Harlem, and, and Brooklyn, and yesterday it was in Costa Rica, and you, you get a glimpse into um, this very authentic moment that they're at home sitting at their personal piano with their composition paper, and just you know singing and speaking straight from the heart. Cool. Let's hear it. Okay, this is um, based on yeah. a fast tango beat that we call milonga, and this is a very popular one, milonga de mis amores. What works here and what doesn't translate as well as you'd love it to as you experiment with this new format? So the technology, as you know, is always a little bit of a challenge because not every musician has like the best setup. Sometimes it's just, you know, a cell phone and sometimes it's actually more complicated when they have a lot of recording equipment. So what's not been working is like every night it's a different sound quality because everyone has a different setup and the artist has a different skill level with their technology. Um, so that, that's been kind of a challenge every night and we're trying to mitigate that by doing sound checks earlier or maybe the day before. And then what is working is obviously the interaction, the interaction from the audience, um, is what's awesome. And it's, it's great when I sort of read the comments to the, to the artists and their face lights up because they're getting that reaction of seeing how their music is touching people. I mean, it seems distant because they're playing in their home. But when, like last night, 
when she's performing from Costa Rica and she has people from India tuning in and asking, when are you coming to Mumbai? I mean, that's a very special moment um, that she probably wouldn't get even in a live concert, you know? So the global nature of this thing is truly astounding and it's connecting people from all corners in the world into into the living rooms of these artists. How does the size of the audience factor in here for you? I'm, I'm sure some performances have a lot of people. Every show is different. Every, every show has, every artist rather has their own community. It just varies. So we're starting to do through about 30,000 views per episode now. That's been really great. But obviously I'm starting to program uh, with the audience in mind. So for example, I know a lot of children's artists. And so I've been programming them during matinee sessions on the weekend so that children can watch live. I made the mistake of programming a children's artist at 10 p.m. at night. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, so I learned uh, how to program it. And the other thing is I'm getting a, um, a lot of requests. So we have about, you know, 35 artists on a waiting list wanting to come on this series. And there's only so many slots that I can do. I do one show every night and then two shows on um, Saturday, two shows on Sunday. It's, you know, just around... 10, 11 shows a week and much many more artists. And I've been hearing from like big record labels now who want me to feature their artists because, you know, their artists were going to go on Saturday Night Live and, you know, all these great shows. But now this is one of the very few series that is paid and and uh, can feature artists in this way. So I'm having a hard time keeping up with, with demand. Uh, but I'm trying to think about booking bigger artists to get the eyeballs up and viewership of, of the series. So something I'm thinking about very closely. Is it the kind of thing where as you experience more demand and you see viewership climb, could this itself give birth to a new model for how we share music? Does it turn into a show afterwards? Yeah, I, I'm thinking about that. You know, I don't know if I can keep up the daily, but um, certainly during this quarantine process, I'm going to try to keep it up. And it's really it's giving me a lot of peace uh, and happiness to make this happen. But as life returns, I mean, I can imagine this a weekly series um, because I think people are starting to get familiar with this technology. And, you know, when you see a great artist that, you know, like performing live, it's something, especially in the music that I do jazz and classical, that's a performance that you'll never hear again. Cause a lot of it's extemporaneous. Yeah. So I can envision a recurring series. Absolutely. Are you talking to the musicians that you're featuring very much about what the experience of the quarantine is like where they are? And that's usually my first question. I said, how is it affecting you personally and professionally? And obviously they'll talk about their entire schedule has been canceled and they don't know what it's um, been like. And I really noticed a distinction. Some artists are feeling very down and out and they're kind of uh, sad about the situation. Um, a few artists have turned this into a period of sort of creative uh, creativity where they've created a schedule for themselves and say, you know what, if I can't be out there touring, I'm going to start writing music. Artists are especially if you're a touring artist, a new city every night, now you're, you know, I don't know how long this is going to be going on, a month or two, whatever, you have 30 to 60 days to write new material. So I know, uh, and I've been getting emails from artists saying, hey, here's a demo that I just did, or here's a song lyric that I just did. So even though my official work hasn't picked up, um, I'm getting a lot of sort of creative emails to start opining on what they're writing, what they're creating. You know, I talked to a writer whose entire book tour had been canceled. She'd called it off. Um, and she was talking about the constant tension that artists feel between the very internal process of creation and then the, the tug to share that creation. And people are wired differently. Some people really live for the moment of sharing. And some people feel like it's a great burden. Um, but for many people this doubling down on the the internal solo time actually really supports their work in the long run. You're right about that. You know, it's something I really struggle with too. I used to just write a lot and I wouldn't even tell my friends I was working on something and then I would release it. And uh, because I didn't like people to know about the projects I was working on and fear that I may not complete it. And then they'd be like, oh, you're the guy who didn't finish the book you were working on. Um, but then I realized I was talking to a friend. He's like, you know, we, I want to know when you're writing this stuff because maybe I can help you. Maybe the community can help you. So now I try to share like works in progress or at least talk with people about some things I'm working on because I think people enjoy seeing like underneath the hood and like how things are made and seeing like how a song is made and how a book is written or maybe not exactly how, but like how much time you're spending on it. And 
I think there's a there is really a community online um, that supports the creation of art, not just the output of art. So this this quarantine concert series is an example of seeing you know uh, I've had a couple of people debut songs on this project, and they say you know we were going to release this <laughs> uh, officially, but uh, this is or this is a work in progress song. You're you're, you're seeing the artist like woodshed uh, some of these pieces in front of you, and you'll be hearing some of these pieces refined and produced you know months if not years from now. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. What it, are you playing any music right now yourself? I'm trying to. I'm trying to sit at the piano for 30 minutes and just play a little bit. And um, I've taken out some old music that I just, you know, Bach preludes and and uh, and then I try to write a little bit of music too. I've I've <clears throat> spent my last year trying to get better at pop music production. So every day I take a tutorial, uh, like a video tutorial on how to get better as a pop music producer because I'm working with a lot more pop artists. So my by producing, I'm like in Ableton, the software, like um, just making tracks and beats and rhythms and just trying to create material that I have in the can um, that's ready to go. And then um, the other thing I should say, uh, it's a little bit of a struggle. It's like I have an album ready to go. I, I recently finished an album with Deepak Chopra, a meditation album called uh, Spiritual Warrior. And, you know, I think every artist is facing this. Should I wait? And like release my music because will it seem weird that I'm launching something in the middle of a a pandemic or on the flip side, like this is a meditation album. Will this actually help people to listen to Deepak's meditations with meditation music? I don't want to be seen as like ghoulish, taking advantage or not, or just, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not um, doing something commercial when we're going through a a period of national emergency. But then of course, like my music doesn't really sell, sell that much. These albums don't sell that much either. So it's not too commercial, but these are all artists are are struggling with, should I release or not? What should I do in this situation? We are struggling with that in, in my operation too. Uh, How do we, how do we make good podcast episodes for people who maybe are a little less interested in excelling in their career right now and a little more interested in making their mortgage payments and protecting their children? Right. And exactly. And where's the balance between speaking to what people need and exploiting them with something that you're maybe putting out for like other more commercial interests? And of course, even if you're not doing that and we aren't doing that, neither of us is um, to be perceived as doing that could be problematic. Yeah. What is the balance? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for all you're doing for artists. It's really cool. Uh, Thank you, Jesse. So what have we got coming up next, Kabir? We have an incredible array of artists. Uh, We have uh, Gregorio Uribe coming live from Colombia. He is a Billboard charting artist. Madeline Peru, one of the best jazz singers of all time. Uh, She's singing her material that's half French-inspired, half American-inspired. Mandy Gonzalez, who stars in Hamilton, will be appearing on the broadcast uh, Jana Herzen, who's the founder of Grammy Award winning Botema Records, will be there. And um, uh, Claudia Acuna, who's a Latin Grammy nominated artist as well. So incredible artists. And we're going to be have we're, we have some household names that we'll be sharing with you soon. Some big celebrities who've expressed an interest and we're just kind of working out the, the logistics and dates. So stay tuned and you'll uh, hopefully we'll see some some beautiful work coming through on the Quarantine Concert Series. Wonderful. Thank you, Kabir. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Kabir Sagal. To see the Quarantine Concert Series, you can tune in to LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram every night at 10 p.m. Eastern. If you're a music fan at all, I really encourage you to check it out. Laura Benanti is a Broadway star and a TV actor. She's got an incredible voice, and she can pack a theater with fans. But as a teenager, she said she felt a little bit more out of the loop, like an ugly duckling. High school musicals were where she felt seen. So when high schools canceled musicals across the country, Laura invited the young stars to sing for her on social media with the hashtag Sunshine Songs. She expected maybe 20 videos. Here's what happened instead. Now it's like almost 5,000 videos that have been sent in. And the, the my original post has been seen like almost 4 million times. Well, I said that they should um, 
you know, post a video of themselves or any rehearsal footage or anything that they may have had and tag sunshine songs. But it's grown so far beyond just kids who are disappointed about their musical. Now it's become like parents and their kids singing and dancing together and, you know, kids in college and like four-year-olds. And it's really expanded beyond even my original intention, which is so fantastic. And now my friend Kate Dieter Meriday, she's um, a mediator down south. She and I um, are partnering with an organiza- organization called K4. We're going to um, sort of put, curate uh, these videos into like 30 minute virtual variety shows, which can then be sent to senior living centers, hospitals, and to any isolated person or anyone, frankly, who would like access to these songs, but doesn't have social media. So, you know, I asked for people to please email us their submissions to, um, oh gosh, I can't remember, uh, the sunshine concert at gmail.com. Um, so you can either submit a video there with the understanding that it will be, you know, sent to hospitals, senior centers, et cetera, or you can request it. So if you are a hospital worker or if you work at a senior center, or if you know someone who's isolated, you can request on their behalf. And what it'll be is basically an e-newsletter. So as long as they have email and can click a link, they're good. Um, and this is a hundred percent a charitable endeavor. No one's making money off of this. This is just purely, you know, to bring some joy to people who like aren't on Instagram and Twitter. My friend Kate and I were talking about like, what can we do to be of service? This is a way that I can be of service. But I think during this time that is just a global emergency, I think we're seeing this desire for interconnection. And I think the best way we can facilitate that right now is using you know, the internet. That's Laura Benanti on the Sunshine Songs. If you want to hear Sunshine Songs for yourself, search the hashtag on Twitter. I do it at least a couple times a week and it really cheers me up. And if you want to hear more from Laura, check out the bonus episode we released last week. You can find it anywhere you listen to Hello Monday. We've been in this new normal for well over a month now. And we've spent a lot of weeks speaking to it as best we can. And now we want to know, where are you at? What do you need from us? What's Monday look like to you right now? What kind of stories help you get through yours? Write us at hellomonday at linkedin.com or respond on LinkedIn using the hashtag hellomonday. And if you like our show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It takes two seconds and it helps new listeners find us. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Ariando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Maya Mangini, Victoria Taylor, Michaela Greer, and Juliette Ferro are our steadfast creative community online. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder, and you also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Stay home if you can. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. It's really nice in here. Yeah. I haven't spent this much time in the closet since I was 15. Um, is that your where coat? Are you? Is that, is that uh, your coats? Coat rack? You, you got dresses back here. This weird shirt I got in Turkey at a flea market. You know. <laughs> this is my uh, parents' dining room. Are you in, what, Houston? Atlanta. 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 Yeah. Okay.